food. Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch title is Health Information Exchange and Interoperability, Are You Connected in Your Community? We are joined today by Alex Horowitz of CalHIPSO, a federally designated regional extension center that helps providers in California navigate the complicated world of electronic health record adoption. In fact, CalHIPSO is the nation's largest REC and a valued education partner of Format Approved. Alex has a wealth of experience in HIE and interoperability. He's the perfect presenter for today's subject, and you can see his extensive uh, experience in HIE on the slide. We're pleased to share his expertise with you today. It's a subject that many people are interested in these days, and uh, there's not very good information out there for folks. So we look forward to today's session. Please note that you can ask questions of our presenter at any time during today's session by entering them into the chat area. In the second half of our session, we will address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent by email link later in the week. Also, remember that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the slides and the recorded version of the event. So people often ask us during the session if they can get the slides and rest assured that we'll send those out to you. All right, Alex, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, Brian. Glad to be here. All right, so let's dive right into it. Um, as I was saying, there's so much interest in this subject now, and I think many people are at a loss uh, for how they can learn more about HIEs and HIOs. So how can they learn about the HIEs or HIOs that are in and around their community? I think that the best way to learn about HIEs and HIOs uh, locally is to try to contact the state resource that exists in your state for uh, health information exchange. The Office of the National Coordinator um, has a number of grant projects. The Regional Extension Center program is one of them, but another one is the State HIE Cooperative um, Agreements Project, where the Office of the National Coordinator gave cooperative grant funding to each state government in order to help them build capacity for health information exchanges in their states. The states um, all went different routes with their funding and what they did with it, but generally speaking, each organization that uh, was designated the receiver of those funds at the state level has some idea of what is going on with health information exchange in that state. That is one charge that they all have is to try to compile that information so they can be a point of contact for any provider in the state that is looking to join an HIE or do something with Health Information Exchange. All right, well, just to take a step back, why is HIE so important for uh, practices and for medical organizations? Why is it important for them to get on top of this? So we're at a place now that the ONC saw coming um, a couple of years ago where electronic health records are now widespread in practices. And unfortunately, those electronic health records are silos of data. It's very difficult to move data from one uh, EHR to another. Often providers end up having to just print records and create paper records all over again just to do referrals or to send, uh, send data to even to a public health agency, anything like that. And that's not, you know, the point of electronic health records was to try to remove paper largely um, and to increase efficiency. And what's happening now is maybe at the internal practice level, there uh, may be increased efficiency from an EHR, but it just all goes to nothing when you have to move the data. So a health information exchange can help move the data from point A to point B outside the four walls of a single organization. Um, and so in order to you know, take advantage of the full efficiency of EHRs, that's where, um, where folks are gonna need to go in order to get their data moved. Well, thank you. I think that may be the best short description of HIE and its importance uh, that I've ever heard. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So let's move on then. Um, what's the difference then between a federated and a centralized HIE? So these are terms that come up very often, um, especially when you talk to anyone like myself who's more technically oriented and they'll say something about, oh, that they're federated HIE or they're centralized, something like that. 
what, they, what folks are referring to when they say those terms is they're referring to where the data resides in the health information exchange. So um, generally speaking, the federated health information exchanges are, the health information exchange itself is an organization that will, <clears throat> will collect data on demand from its constituents. So if there are five members of this health information exchange, five provider organizations or hospitals, what have you, they each have their data silos, which are their uh, EHRs. The health information exchange, when somebody queries the exchange for data on a patient or some p particular piece of data, the health information exchange acts like a directory service, looking around and all of the member organizations' databases for data on that patient will then pull relevant data together, assemble it, and give it to whoever asked for it. In a centralized model, by contrast, the data is already assembled at a centralized location. There's some centralized database where all of these five provider organizations in the previous example have sent their data already. And it may not be the only place where the data resides, but it, and it may be a copy of everyone's data, but it's already sitting there pre-created. Um, in the federated model, once the data has been assembled, it's usually deleted from any kind of maybe temporary central repository that it goes to. So are those the only games in town, or are there other models for HIEs? So those are the two extremes, the two, um, the two kind of points on the, on the con, you know, line uh, that may exist um, of HIE models. Anything that sort of falls in between um, is often called a hybrid health information exchange, which is really not the best term because it's, it's used as a catch-all. You can have organizations where some of the data resides centrally and some of it is federated. Um, people will call that a hybrid exchange. You can, have, um, you can even have models where the data is assembled centrally but it's all it is is a copy of each individual organization's database and a consolidated record is assembled centrally. But even then, you can have exchanges that are based on other um, workflows. Instead of having somebody query the health information exchange looking for a consolidated record on a patient or some consolidated data, you can have health information exchanges that do point-to-point -point exchange, which doesn't sound too good, but really you can have a health information exchange that is essentially pulling and pushing data automatically from multiple entities. So these five entities from our previous example, they may push lab results to each other automatically, or they may push you know, medication lists or allergies or something like that. That um, switchboard, that's moving data between each is called what's called a directed exchange model of health information exchange. So instead of querying the exchange for data, you're automatically getting it on your doorstep. Although generally they're more limited to very specific types of data. And even what's been called direct messaging, clinical direct messaging, is a form of health information exchange um, where you're effectively pushing, where providers are pushing data to each other. Um, as, as opposed to having it automatically sent. So the, there are many uh, models out there, but the big ubiquitous health information exchanges tend to fall somewhere on the continuum of centralized or federated. All right, but it's good to understand that spectrum, that there's you know, going to be an element of either the data is already stored in a central location or it remains uh, with the various organizations themselves and it's then assembled on the fly. And then, but you're saying most of them are some combination of the two. That's correct, and it's, it's good to know that because when somebody tells you, oh, this is the only way to do health information exchange, they probably are not giving you the full story. Many people will say that or try to pigeonhole it as this is the only, only way to do it correctly, and really with health information exchange, there are many ways to tackle that problem and many technologies out there to tackle those problems. So you mentioned direct messaging before, um, and you said that that is a form of HIE. And then there's this issue of the HISP or the directed exchange. Can you describe what a HISP is and sort of map out what this, uh, what this area of the subject looks like? Sure, and as we get into this conversation, there are going to be more and more acronyms, um, so we'll try to <laughs> keep them to a minimum. But <laughs> we'll give people some breadcrumbs. Oh, yeah. A HISP stands for a Health Information Service Provider, which is a very general, it doesn't sound like anything, just sounds like fluff. But really what a... HISP is, is um, 
when you have direct, direct clinical direct messaging is a very standardized technology that the ONC and CMS and many others have, um, have adopted as, they've, they've essentially branded the standard. They've said there is, there is a very um, uh, core set of guidelines around this type of exchange and the organizations that make sure that those, um, all of the security guidelines and data transmission guidelines are in place is what the HISP is. So the HISP mediates the exchange in when you have direct messaging. So taking a step back, direct messaging is like secure email. A provider can, um, can send, with direct messaging, a provider can send an email effectively to another provider organization that contains patient data. This is something that for the longest time has been in violation of HIPAA, not possible because email is not secured. Um, and you would have had to use some other proprietary messaging service. Direct messaging, that platform sits on top of what we would know to be normal email, which for those more technical out there is an STMP style message. So it sits on top of that um, architecture, except it wraps the emails in a security layer that ensures that they are encrypted so that they can be transmitted over the internet to another provider. And you could even go so far as to attach an entire digital clinical record to these emails and send them and it would be HIPAA compliant. Um, of course, the provider has to be proactive and send to another provider. But you, even though many EHRs are starting to say that they have direct messaging capabilities, they have the capability to create an email essentially, they still don't have the capability to do the security wrapping. And there are HISPs out there that exist that do that as their business. Um, often they have a subscription model um, and you, you receive an email, a special email address from the HISP and they will make sure that the correct security guidelines are followed when you send, uh, send direct messages to other providers. That's interesting uh, technology. So they're sending structured data that way, or what are the capabilities? Sure, they can send structured data that way. It's much like an email. So you can send, you could send an email with just some text in it that says, uh, you know, hi, Dr. Jones, I'd like to refer this patient, his name is X, Y, and Z, to you, um, and these, you know, this is his general condition, and just sort of type that into a text field and send that. Sure. Previously, that even wasn't allowable under HIPAA because you were, you know, it was essentially protected health information. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to that, you could attach a CCD or a, a continuity of care document, which is a piece of structured clinical data that essentially contains most of a patient's chart. Um, you could attach that to the email and transmit it and have the, no text in the field and just say, here's, or, you know, here's a patient I'd like to refer to you and just have their entire chart attached. So it could be unstructured or structured data. All right, that's, that's interesting detail. So here's a question that I'm sure many providers have today. How do they know, how can they know, if their EHR is ready to work with an HIE, and what are the costs that they can expect? Sure, um, and this, gets, this is where it starts to get very frustrating for providers because um, many EHR products don't have um, some sort of seal of approval that says all your health information exchange needs are covered with this EHR or even something that is a single price point when you call your EHR vendor and say, what, I need to connect to an HIE, how much does it cost? They'll usually give you some you know, Chinese menu of options and there will be all sorts of different things you can add and the cost can really balloon. Um, so some smaller EHR vendors are interoperable at very, very minimal cost. The larger the vendor, the more they tend to charge. And this is, you know, kind of speaking in generalities here. Um, but uh, you, what you would, the best way to do this is to work with your, uh, the HIE that you plan to join to see what technical specs you need. Um, in order to be part of that HIE and then forward all of those to your EHR vendor. That's a good way to get the cost. But if you haven't bought an EHR yet or you're thinking of changing EHRs, which many, I think, folks are you know, going into 2014, y there are um, some initiatives like what is happening in California with an initiative called HIE Ready. And what HIE Ready does is it um, creates a buyer's guide that says, 
here are some all these EHR vendors. This is how uh, capable they are at different types of um, health information exchange functions and how ready they are to participate and how much it costs to get all of these functions. So if, um, if you'd like, you could access um, the HIE Ready site, um, which I think is linked here in the slide. Um, even though it's, it's, it's specific to California um, insofar as only California is devoting resources to compiling the list, but the metrics, both on the technology side as well as sort of the general consumer uh, metrics, are uh, applicable nationwide. So having a resource like that and showing that to your EHR vendor and saying, for all of these types of exchange, what do I need to pay? Is that already included or not? Is a very powerful tool. Yeah, that I think sounds some like other states are really taking interest in, in those kinds of initiatives. Yeah, it sounds like people really need a roadmap such as HIE Ready provides to them. It it really does, and that's something that um, you know CalHIPSO has partnered with our our state entity for health information exchange in the state, which is called the California Health Equality Program. Um, we partnered with them to try to get the message out there about. Not, not HIE ready specifically, but the idea of having a consumer reports style way of, of, the, of educating providers in, and helping them be able to negotiate with their EHR vendors about health information exchange capabilities. I think that the common uh, misconception is that now that stage two meaningful use has come out, EHR vendors are going to be required to be um, capable to participate with health information exchanges. And the reality is that those certification requirements don't cover everything. So that's that's still, great. We've already had a question about that, actually. So maybe we can return to that at the end of our session. But there's uh, sure. already been a question about Meaningful Use Stage 2 and HIE. So um, there's obviously some interest in that. I'd like to remind our guests that you can ask questions of our presenter at any time during today's session. We'll hold those questions for the end and then uh, pass them on to Alex. So please feel free to ask your questions now or you can ask them later. Let's continue. So what is the difference then between a community HIE and a private or enterprise HIE? Sure. So when we talked about federated and, and um, centralized, those are, the tech, those are words to describe the technical architecture of a health information exchange. Uh, private, the private versus enterprise discussion um, centers around the um, organizational structure of the health information exchange instead. Um, a private health information exchange is a organization that's run by some, generally run by some healthcare provider, usually a large hospital system um, or something like that, maybe a large IPA. Uh, they may say, I, they may want to facilitate interoperability among their as affiliated physicians in the hospital or something along those lines. And so even though there may be many EMRs in that population, they'll set up some sort of system that they administer in order to um, conduct health information exchange among those providers and usually maintain control of it. In a community model, you usually have more uh, unaffiliated providers uh, or, or very loosely affiliated providers who come together and say we should, we would like to exchange data with one another, and um, we'll create some kind of maybe a nonprofit or um, some kind of public utility, especially if they collaborate with the state government or county governments, um, and create some sort of exchange uh, based on that. So a private HIE is this is a for-profit exercise, or it's something that's controlled by the issue is that it's controlled by a, a for-profit outfit. Um, it, it is not even that it's controlled by a for-profit outset. So a private HIE could be, um, could be for-profit. A community HIE could also could feasibly be for-profit, although I I've, I've, think I've only ever seen that model one time. Um, but uh, a private, the issue is that a private HIE is controlled by a single enterprise or healthcare organization, like um, a good, Dignity Health controls their own private health information exchange where the, you know, the corporate structure of Dignity Health is, is where the control is, and other affiliated providers can exchange with each other, but it's a service provided to them by Dignity Health. Um, and whereas a community health information exchange like the state of Nebraska 
Um, it's, it's a public utility model where the state is, is allowing all providers to exchange with each other. And, um, and so that's really the difference. Generally, so a private HIE could be controlled by a nonprofit uh, enterprise, um, like Sutter, for instance, um, whereas generally the community health information exchange, uh, exchanges are run by government bodies, or they are themselves nonprofit organizations. All right, well, that makes a lot of sense. And it sort of, <laughs> it kind of, uh, I think, dovetails nicely with this question, which is, who owns the data in an HIE? And if it's centralized, does that mean that the provider gives up ownership of the data? So one thing I really want to stress is that providers, um, any legitimate health information exchange um, shouldn't be claiming that they own the data. Um, it's, you know, be, being part of a health information, as a provider, being part of a health information exchange shouldn't mean that you don't own your data anymore. Um, that is, it's, it's unfortunately something that has happened. I've seen agreements that providers have signed that effectively they've signed over all of their data to some health information exchange, even on the community side. I've seen it on the community side. I've seen it on the private side. Um, and it's not best practices. And providers, if, you know, you're thinking of joining a health information exchange, ask them what their bylaws around data ownership are or who owns the data. And if they're not able to answer that question or if it is clear that the HIE is going to own the data, I would really think twice before, um, before engaging with that organization because you, sh you should not have to cede your data over to the HIE. And that being said, centralized models, um, just because a, a HIE has a centralized architecture doesn't mean that they necessarily own their data. Um, they're just ha helping to house it for you for exchange in the, those cases, or they should be. So this is something that people really need to do their due diligence on and make sure that they're not uh, inadvertently giving away their data ownership. That's correct. And it doesn't mean that providers, I really, you know, I'm a very big proponent for health information exchange. Um, and so it doesn't mean don't join an HIE. It just means, you know, really, yes, do your due diligence on uh, health information exchanges and, and figure out who owns the data before you join an organization. So what do folks do if there is no HIE in their community? Uh, you know, how can they help their community form uh, such an organization? Sure. Um, and I've seen, I've seen many of them, many of them form uh, from kind of humble beginnings. The best w way to do it is to try to form a, some sort of health information exchange focus group. A single provider or even a single hospital on their own will have trouble um, driving anything. Uh, just by themselves, and you need to have some sort of coalition, even if it's loosely formed. You don't have to do a, form a nonprofit first thing, but you know, forming some kind of focus group is a very, very good way to do this. And what I recommend is, if a provider is interested, to try to pull together everybody in uh, that provider's referral network, including the hospital, um, including even even going so far as to include the labs and radiology groups, um, to try to bring everybody as much of that referral network to the table as possible. And invite everybody who you invite to bring their referral networks as well, so you sort of get two degrees of separation. That should form a good, if, if you can agree that you want to be exchanging data, then you've formed an HIE focus group. You don't have to agree on the model, centralized or federated. You don't have to agree on any of that at the outset, but forming that focus group is the first step. And at that point, um, Getting in touch with your state designated HIE entity is a good idea because they may be able to um, devote resources. Some of the HIE, state HIE entities even have funding out there to help send somebody to be a convener for your group. Some of them even have grant funding out there to help start up HIEs, especially in rural and safety net communities. Um, it does vary from state to state, but um, it's a very good way to get started. All right, so we've alluded a little bit to meaningful use, but if uh, providers don't join an HIE in 2014, does that mean they're disqualified for meaningful use incentives? Um, they No. So you don't need to, in, starting in January 2014, you don't have to join a health, you know, the nearest health information exchange and, and just go with that. Um, the rules are being eased in very slowly, and you don't need to join a full-blown one in order to meet H2 requirements. What you will most likely need to do 
is you, you may need to join a HISP or join some sort of, um, even join an HIE that has HISP services because many of the meaningful use stage two requirements require direct messaging in order to move data around. Um, and so that's probably where you would, where as a provider you would want to look for stage two is where are some HISPs or who are some HISPs that um, could help me? Could I join a health information exchange that would solve this problem? Maybe, but you can sort of do it the lightweight way by joining a HISP. And that's another, you know, asking your state HIE entity about HISPs in your state is also a good resource. All right. But it will really make things easier if you join a health information exchange. I do want to say that. It, it will help you not only for stage two, but anything beyond that. Um, it, you know, they, the HIEs, whereas the EHRs had to um, do a pretty heavy lift to help with meaningful use stage one, and they're having to do it for stage two, it's starting to transition where the next group that's going to really have to do the heavy lift on this are the HIEs. And so why not, as a provider, take advantage of, you know, that, that work that they're, you know, they're being, they're being forced to put out the work on, on you know, on uh, providers' behalf to help them meet these measures. So it, um, it really, you know, it's, now is the time to think about joining a health information exchange very seriously. Right, and beyond meaningful use, I mean, the incentives are obviously important from a financial perspective, but you know, there's a greater purpose here, of course, and that is that, as you were saying at the beginning, as people have moved into electronic health records, there is such a need for this ability to exchange data in a way that, you know, is efficient and that works and meets HIPAA requirements and everything. So meaningful use or no meaningful use, this is something people really need to get on top of. Oh, absolutely. I, it doesn't help anybody to have data siloed in, you know, these independent electronic health record deployments um, and, you know, a common misconception about HIE is that it really only benefits the hospitals or the large organizations because they can save, you know, they can save money because they don't have to print everything. They can um, save money on staff time because they don't have to have people deal with all, you know, printing all these referrals and doing things with them. But it only, and that it only affects people with, you know, the volume um, to reduce costs. But that's not, not true. It really can be a fine, there are financial incentives for even small providers to join health information exchanges um, even in the short term. And, and one of the really big ones can be uh, reduction in medical errors even at the small practice level. Many, and there are a lot of stories um, out there, but um, being able to see where a patient has been um, before they've come into your office, what medication, you know, a more complete medication list, those kinds of things can be um, you know, even avoiding one medical error should be all of, I think, our goals. And um, there are fiscal incentives for that, obviously, but there are, you know, there are quality of care incentives for that as well. So who sells the technology for HIEs? Are there companies that are similar to EHR vendors, or how can people actually purchase products? So there are. There, there are vendors out there whose sole um, business is to sell health information exchange technology platforms. Um, it's not quite as uh, structured as EHR vendors are. Uh, you, these HIE vendors usually can, can really customize products. They're sort of a combination between a consulting company and a, and a technology vendor. Um, and there are companies like uh, there are companies like BrowserSoft or Optum or um, you know Covisant. Those are all kind of examples of that. But health information exchange platforms, the platforms themselves are very very expensive, um, and it you know no single provider or provider organization can generally and this are very large enterprise can generally afford to not only buy it in the first place but pay the support fees and and those kinds of things to keep it running. So um, that's why you need to, be, to form a coalition um, in order to help pay for something like that and why, gen why a lot of HIEs have been funded, especially the community ones, have been funded through grant funding because someone needs to help with that, um, with that procurement process. And so, you know, you've, you mentioned the franchise option. The, the nice thing about that is that you're not having to sort of reinvent the wheel, so to speak, that you actually get something that, it has already been fleshed out, I guess you could say. Sure, yes. So the, the franchise, 
franchise option um, generally refers to, you know, there are, have been there have been HIEs operating in the country since the early, even actually since the 90s in some places. Um, and there are a few community HIOs that are very strong and successful in the country. The further towards the East Coast you go, the more examples of strong, independent community health information exchanges there are. Um, those exchanges have already shelled out all the money to build uh, a technology model. They've, they have a nice governance model already set up. And often, if you're in a community with a focus group, maybe with a little bit of grant funding, and you are looking, you're thinking of building your own HIE, sometimes it's a better option to contact those other successful HIEs and say, could you just deploy your, your platform and your model in our community as a franchise? And we'll, you know, generally you'd have to pay support fees to that HIE. But um, oftentimes when you make those kinds of arrangements, you can have local control it's just that somebody else has already done the heavy lifting for you. And it can be a much more cost-effective option. And you still own almost as, much of the, um, almost as much of the process as you would if you went through the whole long procurement. But you do have to realize that some HIEs took years and years to, um, to get up to speed and off the ground, even working with these HIE vendors, these technology vendors. So talking to the existing HIEs, even if they're in the next state, they may be able to help you. So in the context of HIEs, what, is, what do people mean when they talk about governance or governing control, and why does it matter? Sure. So I mentioned governance um, about when I was talking about the franchise models. And you know, an HIE isn't just a piece of technology that you have, and you run it in the background, and it automatically will you know, do all the exchanging. There has to be someone, not only, not only an organization or group, that is managing that, um, that exchange but also someone who sets the rules. Um, the technology vend HIE technology vendors aren't held, to, um, aren't held to the regulatory standards that EHR vendors are in terms of um, their you know, products have to function in XYZ way. They're very customizable. And the group that's held to the, to accountable for meeting all the rules is generally the, whoever is, uh, has bought the product. So it's a little bit different than an EHR. And especially community HIOs need to form, need to have some kind of governance uh, entity in place. Usually, a, maybe a nonprofit board is the governance body. Uh, some kind of um, physician advisory council might be the um, might be the governing entity. But those um, organizations need to, um, you know, there needs to be something there, some structure there for governance to both manage the exchange and also to set the rules for exchange um, and to help build trust between the providers. Because if you've been in a room with some providers and you've all decided on what kind of HIE you want to build, um, the on, there's, without the governance there to hold everyone together and to hold the exchange accountable, there's no ongoing continued trust between providers. And health information exchange really cannot exist without a trust framework there. Obviously, that would be an important consideration when you're looking at uh, a private HIE versus a community HIE. One of the key differences, I would think, has to be governance. Sure, yeah. They, uh, private health information exchange, is their governance is usually the corporate structure of whatever en um, enterprise has set up that private HIE. Right, they own so it, it. So Right, they own it. They own it and they run it. Sometimes... Um, you know, if it's a large hospital system, they'll have some sort of physician advisory council that helps them. But when it comes down to it, the CEO of whatever company that is, that is where the buck, you know, the buck stops with that person. And, um, and so when you're, you know, joining a private HIE isn't a negative thing necessarily. It can, be, it can make all the sense in the world, especially if it has a provider you're very, very closely associated with a hospital system that has a private HIE that is very probably very low cost to you. Usually the private HIEs are, are more cost effective for providers. Um, it makes all the sense in the world, it may, to join that private HIE. You just have to realize that the governing control is much uh, less, maybe democratic, um, than, than it would be in a community health information exchange. All right. Well, we've uh, save plenty of time for questions, and that's a great thing because we have a large number of questions already. Um, this is a rare opportunity to 
have a, an expert at your disposal to answer some of your questions around HIE, so I certainly encourage all of our guests to take advantage of this opportunity. And many of you already have, but keep the questions coming. All right, Alex. And I'd like to remind folks that we're going to send out written answers to these uh, questions as well. So if uh, anyone asks a very technical question or something that requires a longer written response, we certainly give Alex the option of uh, following up in writing for questions that may be more easily answered in that form. Okay, let's start with our first question. Is there somewhere you can check the status of a provider through a HISP? If that question makes sense. I, I'm not quite sure, sure what they I, mean by the status, but... I think that that, that may make I think um, going into some detail about direct messaging might help. So, um, and what I imagine that question may be going towards is, can you check if, if you're a provider and you're on a HISP? Can, how do you know if the provider down the street ah, is on a HISP? Right. Um, and that, it, you know, how do you know that you can send data to them? And that's a, that's a big question because right now, right at this current moment, the way that HISPs are structured, you only you, HISPs will maintain some sort of provider directory. They'll know, okay, all these providers are in our uh, in our HISP, and it will often function sort of if you've ever used Outlook or any of those applications. When you start to type a email, uh, somebody's name like a doctor's name, Doctor Jones, into the um, email bar, it will know. Who, you know, it will find that person's email address and automatically pop their HISP email address and automatically populate it in that field, which is nice. So you don't have to know that his email address is, you know, drj15 at whatever, uh, his, you know, myhisp.com or something like that. You would be able to just use his name. But if somebody else is not on the same HISP as you, you don't have that functionality. It's, it's still sort of a closed network in that sense. There are many efforts, and there's a lot of money at the federal level and some state organizations as well, going into building um, uh, a capability for provider the HISP's provider directories, so between HISP A and HISP B, to be able to query each other. So there's sort of a, a patch, a knitting of all of the HISPs in the country so that everybody is connected. Um, and you have that capability across, uh, not just across um, HISPs, but even across states. Um, and, and those kinds of things. There's two organizations that you could follow if you're really interested in, um, in that process. One of them is called directtrust.org. They um, actually, they're out of Rhode Island and they in, sort of invented direct messaging um, indirectly a couple of years ago. Uh, and they're working on that. And there's also a group called um, the National Association of Trusted Exchange, which is um, uh, abbreviated NATE. In the west, on the west coast, they were formerly called the Western States Consortium, and they are both of those organizations are developing ways to um, to have those provider directories be able to talk to each other, um, and and hopefully that way you won't have to go down the street and ask Dr. Jones if he's on another HISP. You could um, you could just know yourself, and I do want to also disclaim that. The part of the structure of direct messaging is such that if you try to send an email to Dr. Jones and you mess up his email address, and it goes, to, you know, it it doesn't go to him. Um, the direct the HISP, one of their jobs is they'll block that message because they're trying to head it off before it turns into some HIPAA violation when it goes to someone else's email. It and they'll say that's not a direct messaging address, um, and they'll send usually a message back that says, oh, this was failed because you know X, Y, and Z thing. So you can't accidentally send it to the wrong, well, you could accidentally send it to the wrong HISP address, but you can't accidentally send it to an outside email address where it would, you know, you'd have to have a HISP violation on your hand. Well, that seems like an important function. So you can't send it to a non-HISP address. That's right. Well, here's a related question. Uh, the question is how or whether does the vendor, the EHR vendor you use, does that um, influence your ability to join a HISP or which HISP you should join? So it does to some degree. Um, 2014 EHR certification requirements effectively require that EHRs need to be HISP ready. They don't need to have a HIP, you know, have their own HISP, but they need to be able to work with another independent HISP. Um, that being said, some EHR vendors have their own HISPs that they're starting up, and by and by being Having that EHR product, you automatically become a member of that HISP. 
sometimes they'll actually say, you can become a member of our special HIST if you pay us an extra amount of money. Um, but the majority of the HR vendors are not going down that road because HISPs have to be independently certified um, by certifying bodies that they operate properly. And uh, the EHR vendors, I think, are too busy shelling up their own products for 2014 than trying to go get some other separate certification. So um, if your vendor is not 2014 certified, you probably can't operate with a HISP um, with your EHR. If it is, then you should be able to operate with a HISP, and you should check with your EHR vendor to see if they're running their own HISP. And I've asked a lot of EHR vendors, and they don't, sometimes don't know the answer to that question. So. Um, <laughs> it's good to, good to be able to dig into a little bit of detail with them. So here's the question that we had earlier about meaningful use, and it's um, whether you're actually required to join an HIE to meet stage two. Sure. And is, is there more detail in the question at all? Uh, that's all that's there at this point. Maybe we'll get a follow-up. And so the real answer, the, the, um, this is a good place to take a step back. There is a distinction between um, a HIE, so the noun, and HIE, the verb. And this gets confusing a little bit. Uh, yeah, HIE, the point. noun, is called Health Information Organization, or HIO. So those are interoperable terms, but only for the noun form. Mm -hmm. So an HIE, the noun, you do not have to join one of those in order to meet stage two requirements. You don't have to join. HealthBridge or New York Reach or any of those big HIEs, um, you will have to do some amount of health information exchange, the verb, though. And that's why I'm saying that joining a HISP is probably your best bet if you're really looking for something lightweight, because it will allow you to do a minimal amount of data exchange between providers to meet stage two measures. Well, that sounds like great advice. Yeah, you are going to have to move data outside your four walls in order to meet stage two requirements. Um, but you don't need to do all of the things that health information exchanges often you know, have as value adds or, or those sorts of, of things. And so the requirements are loose enough that even for folks who are in areas where they may not have ready access to an HIE, they can still meet the stage two requirements. Yes. And that's where getting in touch with both your state HIE organization as well as your, the regional extension center for your area will be helpful. And, and the regional extension centers, CalHIPSO included, are in a transition phase, moving from helping folks with stage one to helping folks with stage two, um, as well as stage one. So some of the RECs are, still may not have a strategy or know how they're going to help providers, but some RECs are very advanced in their capability to tell providers, here are the three things you need to do for stage two in this state. Um, or in your area. And so they're also a very, it can be, and will continue, to, especially in 2014, to be a very, very good resource. All right, let's move on to our next question. The question is, our state has only push, uh, you talked before about push-pull uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing some state HIE functioning as both push using SMTP and pull? Yes, some state HIEs are using both. Um, push and pull. Some state HIEs, what they are doing is they, actually their first line of service a couple of years ago when some of these got set up was a query uh, response sort of um, architecture where they, they would set up a big federated HIE and it connected to pretty much everybody in the state. And when you ask, I need, um, you know, John Smith's record. It would ask, it would query every single database it could touch in the state and pull together everything it could on that particular provider and present it to the, or I'm that particular patient and present it to the provider. Um, and then now they're, then they're starting to um, build up HISP functionality as a secondary um, service line. So those exist. Um, they tend to be in the smaller states. <laughs> you know, big states don't usually have a big consolidated government run health information exchange because it, they're, it's too expensive and they have smaller regional exchanges in the state. California is a great example. Um, but yes, some states are offering that and some states are only offering direct messaging. They're uh, making a statewide HISP and they're taking all of that on themselves, the state government, usually health and human services or something like that, public health, and, um, and you, you know, work through them for your HISP. So it is definitely a patchwork. 
All right, let's ask our next question then. Here, it's, uh, there's kind of a statement and then a question at the end. You talked about ownership of the data. I was under the assumption that data that's passed through or stored in an HIE is only de-identified data. If that's correct, then the full data set only resides in the EHR and is owned by the EHR subscriber and not the HIE. Is this correct? So most HIEs um, do not only operate with de-identified data. All the data I've been talking about so far has been identified patient data that's moving in the HIE. Um, de-identified, uh, let me take a step back. So even in cases where identified patient data is passing through the HIE, the, um, there's no reason why the HIE has to own that data if it does so. They would, you know, they're acting as a, um, they're acting as an agent for transporting the data and would need to, you know, have business associate agreements with all the physicians and everything else, but they would not become the, the sole stewards and owners of that data or even be considered a covered entity under HIPAA as a care provider or something like that. They are just an, a, an agent for moving the data from one place to another, even if it's in a centralized repository. Uh, at the HIE level, um, and even if it's it's identified data. De-identified data and health information exchange is a kind of separate conversation, and often if an HIE is doing anything with de-identified data, they're doing, um, doing population health analytics or something like that, and, um, and usually uh, that's kind of a, that may be, it really varies from place to place and doesn't have anything to do with meaningful use. It may have something largely to do with ACOs or PQRS, but um, but it doesn't. It's not the usually the first business of HIEs. So, if someone wants to become a HISP, where do they find information on being a certificate authority and registry authority? Here's someone who knows a little bit about HISP. HISP, yes. I get the sense. So. Um, for everybody else, a certificate authority and registry authority, those are the, the technical terms for the responsibilities of a HISP, um, of what they actually, the functions they provide are there, a certificate authority and a registry authority, meaning they, um, they manage and create and issue security certificates for providers so that they can, um, they can access the data that's protected by the HISP. And then they all, the registry authority is that they um, keep track of which providers are on the HISP and make sure that messages get delivered to the right place and, and those kinds of things. So um, where do you find out about being those? You should contact Nate or directtrust.org and or your state HIE entity. Um, because just as a disclaimer, some state HIE entities are members of directtrust.org or Nate, meaning that they're, they have individuals on the boards of those organizations. So sometimes they can be a better path, especially because directtrust.org and Nate are getting all kinds of people asking them questions. So those, those are your three resources for finding out if, um, if you want to be a certificate authority or a registry authority. Um, the other piece I should mention is uh, just if you're in Oregon, let's say, and that's definitely in the Western States area, that's where Nate is operating. You don't have to only talk to Nate about being a HISP. You could talk to directtrust.org anywhere you are, and you could talk to Nate anywhere you are, even if you're not part of, you know, in one of the Western states. So ideally, you would want to talk to both because their definitions of certificate authority and registry authority are very slightly different, um, and so, and so one may fit your uh, your organization's desires or needs better than the other. Well, one of our guests has just asked again if you could, uh, what does HISP stand for again? Health Information Service Provider. You can think of it like clinical email provider, though. The way they operate, and uh, a good way to think about them, is like Hotmail.com. Um, you know, they, Hotmail, when you went there, they, you would sign up, and they would give you an email address, you know, uh, John Smith at Hotmail.com and you could use that for email. And, and you, even if you had another email address, let's say your Gmail address, you could forward messages from your Hotmail account to your Gmail account and you know, still send emails out of your Gmail account from your, technically from your Hotmail account. 
a HIF is exactly like that. They issue you a, a um, email account and manage your messages in the security layers, but um, it's just an alias, and so you can, if you know, you could even some HIFs even have the capability where, if you wanted to send all your messages out of Outlook and Gmail and just do email forwarding, you could actually do that, and it would be fine. You're just getting the email address from them, and 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 the you know, then the security layers and everything that are around it. So it's like premium email. Well, I have to say, in my conversations with providers, I I think the uh, word is not out on HISP and sort of the capabilities that it could bring to people. It really, yeah, it's not, and it um, these technologies sometimes take a while to uh, permeate, and then e you know I must say that with direct messaging is probably the easiest to use and most just generally user friendly technology that has come out in the last 10 years on this. Um, and I think a lot of people have, you know, they hear, oh, there's a new new technology platform out. It must be really hard and, to use and expensive. And, you know, with HISPs, it's not so much. It's kind of a new, a new wave, um, a new wave in the industry. All right, let's move on to our next question. If you need to choose between a state HIE or a local HIE, is it better to go straight to the state and ultimately, are all HIEs going to be connected at the state level? Uh, so that's a very, very good question. And I'll have to say that it depends on which state you're in. Um, and I'm going to give some examples. And if anybody's on the phone from these HIEs and, and they need to correct me, that's fine. But the, um, you know, uh, some states have a statewide HIE and then a number of local HIEs that are independent and not connected to the state HIE. And some have state HIEs where the local HIEs are sort of just the, the local branches of the state. And the latter, um, an example of the latter type is um, the state of New York. They have one state entity that is sort of administering all of these local HIEs that at one time where they may have been fully independent or something, or, or they may have been actually formed by the state HIE as sort of the local branch. Um, and in that case, you could do, you might be actually better off going to the state first, and they'll direct you to the one, the local HIE that best suits your needs, um, because they're broken up geographically, largely. Um, there are other cases where the state HIE actually covers all of the state except for one little area that has its own local HIE, and then you, you might be better off joining the local one if that's the area you're in, because they have the people in your referral network that make sense. Um, or you might have to choose, or you might have to become part of one of both. Um, and you could become be a member of more than one health information exchange, uh, although it may not make fiscal sense if they're both trying to charge you money for it. Um, so you, you may have to make a decision, and the decision usually lies in two categories. One is, is my referral network on this health information exchange? Because you should only be on the one that your referral network is, is on, because it, you, know, you don't need to exchange data with someone you know, a thousand miles away very often. But the guy next door, you need to exchange data with. Um, and then two, what are the rules? What are the, you know, what are the governance rules and bylaws for each of these HIEs? If one of them, one of them says, I own, you know, the HIE owns all the data, and, and, but they may have your referral network on it, that's a tough spot because you should, you should only join the one that's following best practices. Um, uh, Either way, so best practices as well as um, referral network are the two decision points, and then cost sometimes if one of them is charging you money. All right. Well, this is related. Uh, you, it's a question about payment and joining multiple bodies. I'll just read it to you here. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Sure. The question is, Social Security Administration would like us to be HIE so they can pull. If we join an HIE that is a member of Healthway, do we pay only the HIE or both the HIE and participant fee to Healthway? Can you, oh, are they saying Health E Way? Health E Way. I'm sorry. I, I'm misreading it to you. Okay. Could you read the question one more time? Sure. So the question is, Social Security Administration would like us to be HIE so they can pull. If we join an HIE that is a member of Health Eway, do we only pay? Do we pay only the HIE or both the HIE 
and the participant fee to Healthy Way? That's a little bit of a confusing question, but it, um, I can do a little bit of explaining there. Okay. Um, so Healthy Way is something that can come, uh, that may come up. You may encounter HIEs that say, "Oh, we're on Healthy Way, or we're Healthy Way capable, or we're." Um, you know, we, we have that capability. And what Health E-Way is, so rem remember back when I was talking about with the, the HISPs having the provider directories talk to each other for different HISPs, the Health E-Way is, <laughs> is similar except it's a, it has to do with HIEs being able to talk to each other. So the, H the state HIE in Nebraska doesn't really have a way, if there's a provider in Michigan that wants to query that HIE for some reason for data, they can't because they're, even though they're part of their Michigan State HIE. Um, and so Healthy Way is a, is, a, is a set of governance standards. There's a, a bunch of you know, rules around it and also a technology platform that allows the guy in Michigan to ask through his Michigan HIE, he asks his Michigan HIE for patient data on a patient in uh, Nebraska HIE, and the HIEs will, you know, they'll pull data from each other essentially and, and present the data to the provider who's asking for it. Um, and the healthy way is, the, it's more advanced than the um, provider directory communications for HISPs. It's actually been deployed. There are many HIEs that are part of it. Um, in fact, in my, in my bio, I talk about InWin on there, and that technology platform was piloted with the HIE I architected in California, so I'm quite familiar with it. And it, um, the, so if you shouldn't have to pay Healthy Way anything, uh, to answer the question, you shouldn't have to pay Healthy Way anything. The HIE that you're going to join should have already onboarded and paid whatever fees they need to, um, et cetera. And, uh, and so if you join an organization that is part of Healthy Way, then yes, other um, HIEs in other states may be able to query for your data. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and you may not necessarily know who they are. You're essentially trusting that the HIE you're joining is doing its due diligence to know, you know who is going to be querying for other states, that sort of thing. Um, I hope that answers the question a little bit about Healthy Way. Well, because we are out of time, we're going to assemble all of the audience questions. We got to most of them, but not all. And uh, we'll give Alex a chance to give some written answers to some of those questions. Um, we'll post those answers on our site with links delivered via email later in the week. I'd like to thank you, Alex, for joining us for today's learning lunch. It was really a great session. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks again, Brian, for having me. I really uh, appreciate being here. This is valuable information for people, and it's, it's hard for folks to find information about this subject, so I think this has been a fantastic presentation. To learn more about CalHIPSO, uh, please visit www.calhipso.org. And Alex, you mentioned before the HIE Ready tool, um, and we, we'll send out the slides to folks so they can see that URL, but if they're on your site, what's the best way to find it? Uh, the HIE Ready tool is hosted on, and I can't remember, it's, it's on our site, and if you go to the Educational Resources section, it's in there, and there's also a link um, that I could send out with my written responses directly to the HIE Ready website. So watch for that uh, follow-up email, and you'll see links to that information. I think HIE Ready would really help a lot of people get a grip on what they should expect and what their options are around HIE. Um, I'd like to thank all of our attendees today. It was a lively session and uh, great questions from folks. Remember that all registered attendees will receive an email with links to both the slides and the video recording of this session. For comprehensive training and meaningful use, register for Format Approved Certified Meaningful Use Professional Course. The course covers the requirements for both Stage 1 and Stage 2 of Meaningful Use for both eligible professionals and eligible hospitals along with clinical quality measures, HIPAA considerations, and more, visit formatapproved.com slash education slash courses underscore cmup.html. I know that's quite a mouthful. You can see the URL on your screen to learn more about that course and register. Visit formatapproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning lunches. The learning lunch button will take you to our entire slate of upcoming webinars. Our next learning lunch will air on October 2nd, and we'll cover the subject of clinical quality measures understanding the reporting and submission requirements. 
Keep an eye on your email box and our homepage for other upcoming to topics. And thank you again for joining us today.